I blame global okay. warming up here. So. so yesterday you learned how to draw some uh, shapes. shapes, didn't you? You learned how to draw a Lewis dot structure. Okay, I want you to look specifically at the Lewis dot structure for the nitrate ion. Here it is, right here. Here it is, right here in focus. You can see that in this iteration, they drew the double bond here. In this one, right here, and in this one, right here. All three of these are valid Lewis dot structures. How do you know which bond to put the, which uh, oxygen to put the double bond on? It really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, in nature, there will be a mix of molecules that will have the double bond in this position, in this position, and in this position. This mix of uh, molecules are called resonance structures. When you are asked to draw the Lewis dot structure for the nitrate ion, you must include all three versions. And you know what? You will live through the procedure. You, this is a second class to many ground. You know you really like drawing loose dot structures anyway. Uh, so Vindy knows like 15 <laughs> different possibilities. Okay. There are not 15 different. Benzene. Okay. Well, we won't do benzene. It is a uh, organic molecule, and we skip organic molecules. All right. Let's uh, remind ourselves that uh, the Lewis dot structure model is just a model. It's just something that helps us think about the way that the electrons share um, with each other in a covalent bond. The model won't work if you have odd numbers of electrons. So nitrogen monoxide, you can't use the model that we've been talking about. It just doesn't work. Alrighty. Formal charge, I will leave uh, for your college professor because uh, I don't want to talk about it. We, the AP people don't test on formal charge. Formal charge is a way to figure out what is the best Lewis dot structure. So if there are Lewis dot structures that could be, um, if you find you can draw two totally different Lewis dot structures, you figure out the formal charge and it will tell you which one is the most valid. This is going away from the AP test. I'm certain you're not going to see it. Let's not spend any time on it. Everything. Yeah. Everything that would go in. Yes. No. The uh, those you can throw away. All right. Um, today we are going to talk about the shape that a molecule will take. And we're going to use a, the second part of our model, and it calls for VESPER. VESPER is the valence shell electron pairs repulsion theory. And it's based on the fact that electrons will repel each other, yes? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So although these electrons need to be shared between atoms, they're really not happy uh, being in close proximity <coughs> to electrons. So they will orientate themselves so they're far apart as possible while still being able to um, share. So uh, here is a Vesper chart. Mm -hmm. This is what I want you to know so far today. First of all, remember the number of electron pairs around the central atom? That um, is one thing that we will remember we are talking about all the time just the central atom. The second thing that I want you to know is on your packet paper we call these a domain. And we defined a domain <coughs> as being one thing. Okay, one domain is equal to a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond and a lone pair. When you're looking at the central atom, all of these things count as one domain. 
Now, these domains give rise to the electron geometry around the central atom that's otherwise known as Vesper. So, if I were to draw water, I would look at it and I'd say, hmm, how many electron domains are there around the central atom? One, two, three, four. So, I would look at my um, uh, electron domain thing and I would say, hmm, it's tetrahedral. It's a tetrahedral shape according to Vesper. Got that? Yeah. If I were to draw carbon dioxide, I would say around the central atom there are two, two. two domains. Two domains means it has the Vesper shape of linear. So, the way we do this is we draw a Lewis dot diagram, we count the number of domains, then we find the Vesper uh, shape. Now we're going to refine this a little bit and we're going to talk about the molecular geometry. A Vesper uh, geometry does not take into account whether the domains are lone pair or bonding pair. And in fact, that will skew the shape a little bit. So to be more precise in what the shape of the molecule looks like, we will account for the um, lone pairs. And that gives rise to these two um, columns. We're going to count the number of bonding pairs around the central atom. And the way I like to think of this is not that, but the number of sigma bonds. That was a sigma. Here, look at it again. It's a fat P with a straight line. Got it? Half of a circle in a straight line. Sigma bonds. Okay. A bonding pair always contains a sigma bond. Now, a single bond is composed of one sigma bond. A double bond is composed of one sigma bond and one pi bond. A triple bond is composed of one single bond and two pi bonds. And we use these two columns to help us figure out the molecular geometry. So these two columns determine molecular geometry, while this column determines Vesper. So if we go back to my example, we decided that the Vesper shape for this was tetrahedral. So Vesper is tetrahedral. But the molecular geometry has two sigma bonds and two lone pair. So when I look that up in my chart, two sigmas, two lone pair, it's angular or bent. And in fact, that is the case. If I were to draw a representation of water, this is how it aligns itself in space, and this is a, uh, my 2D representation of a 3D thing. <coughs> These are sticking out uh, as far away as possible. This is the shape it will take, bent, uh, to minimize the repulsion of the electrons. Now, the bond angle between the central atom and the ligands is for a bent molecule 109 degrees. 0.5. 0.5. 109.5 degrees. 
that you need to know. Now we're talking about uh, our carbon dioxide. Uh, it was linear Vesper. It has two sigma bonds, no lone pairs, and so its molecular geometry is also linear, and its bond angle is 180 degrees. That means between the central atom, it's uh, straight. So that makes it linear. Are we clear with this? Yeah, what are the bonding electrons here around the central atom? What? Yeah. Okay, this is, uh, in this, in this, uh, these examples, I'm just counting the sigma bonds in anything around the central atom. Any bonding here in the sigma bond. Okay. So, in fact, any bond around the central atom counts as one. Doesn't matter if it's uh, single, double, or triple. Okay, and the okay. non-bonding ones are the... Are the uh, dots. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now, time to bum puzzle yourself. Again? Yep, pretty much. You kind of stay there. All right, I need to talk about polarity of a bond, and then I want to talk about polarity of a molecule. <laughs> Here is a, a Vesper drawing of water. Remember a couple of days ago, we decided that we could tell if a bond holding together two atoms is polar or not by checking out the difference in electronegativity. If the difference in electronegativity is 0.5 or greater, we called it a polar bond. And I'm talking about the link between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Right now, tell me what the change in electronegativity is between oxygen and hydrogen. Where is that little thing? Your chart. Yeah, you, take a trip to the yeah, you do. So I'm not even going to answer the question. Uh, what is it, Holly? 1.4? Okay. The difference in electronegativity is 1.4. This bond is a polar covalent bond. That seemed easy. Got it? This is what we did before. So it would seem. Now, I want to talk about another type of polarity, and that would be the polarity of the molecule itself. Whether the molecule has a slightly negative side and a slightly positive side. You know that the molecular shape of water looks like this, don't you? Yep. You do. I would like to know if this molecule has a slightly negative end and a slightly positive end, does it? Yes. Yeah. Here's the test to determine if a molecule itself is polar. A molecule, not the bond, a molecule can be considered polar if the bonds holding it together are polar. That would be the bonds hooking together two atoms. And if the molecule as a whole is asymmetrical, we will deem a molecule to be asymmetrical if it contains a lone pair. Both of these conditions must be true in order for the molecule as a whole to be polar. So if I were to go back to my discussion of water and carbon dioxide, we decided that uh, 
bond between O and H has a delta En of uh, 1.4, so it does have polar bonds. And around the central atom, remember all we care about is the central atom, do we have asymmetry? Yes. Yes, we have asymmetry because there are lone pairs. These lone pairs do not cancel each other out. We won't talk any further about that. All you have to do, if it's a lone pair, we're calling it asymmetrical. Test one has been passed. It's a polar bond hooking together the atoms. And the molecule as a whole is asymmetrical, which means it has lone pair. So this is a polar molecule. Now let's look at carbon dioxide. What is the delta En between carbon and oxygen? 1.4. What is it? 1.0. 1. 1. Is that polar or nonpolar? Polar. polar. It is polar. Are there any lone pairs around the uh, central atom? No. So it is symmetrical. So not both of the tests are true, so it must be a nonpolar molecule. Understood? Sure. All righty. Now, um, I am fixing to set you loose and do um, some of your packet. However, there have been a lot of questions about how to draw the molecules. And I'm going to leave this up here for you. All right, please be aware that, uh, first of all, these are the Vesper shapes. Just the Vesper shapes. Um, I'm going to try to find the molecular geometry for you in an easy format, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to. I uh, remember these are. 2D representations of 3D molecules. Okay. Okay? So, I think you are ready to get to work. Get to work. Mm -hmm.